What's up, guys and gals? Welcome back to the Nerd Castle for the first episode in our coverage of Caves of Cud. This is one of those games a long time ago that I had done a weekly indie newcomer on, and I found this, I honestly, I think this is one of the greatest roguelikes ever made. Like, I really, really enjoy this game. It's up there with Doom RL, it's up there with Tome for me. It's a game that I've always wanted to do a series on, but we never really had any space on the channel, so I couldn't squeeze it in. As of right now, we have space on the channel. Now, I know I said on Twitter that it was a toss-up between this and The Long Dark. You're probably still going to get The Long Dark, because honestly, Caves of Cut is one of those games where you don't tend to survive for very long. And so chances are, this is only going to be like a four or five episode series before we move on to something else. If you've never seen Caves of Cud before, it's a classic roguelike in which you're a character in a post-apocalyptic world where there's all kinds of mutations and weird things going on. This is a strange game, and that's actually one of the reasons why it's so near and dear to me. A lot of games kind of toe the line, and they are just bog-standard fantasy RPGs with orcs and goblins and trolls and that kind of stuff. This is a game that's a bit more like Dune meets Gamma World meets Fallout meets... I, it's got a lot of influences in it. This game is definitely drawing from a lot of different locations, but I think you're going to like it. So here at the beginning of the first episode, the big thing that we're going to jump into first is that we need to create for ourselves a character. I'm going to do my best to treat this like a tutorial as well, meaning... For the first episode or two, I'm really going to kind of narrate what keybinds I'm using and what I'm doing because in the same way that this is a classic roguelike, there are a lot of hotkeys that you need to know in order to play the game properly. So without further ado, let me get my mouse off the screen right there because we're not going to be using that anyways. This is very much a keyboard based game. I'll do my best to get you up and moving and playing Caves of Cud at least at like a novice level by the time you get to the end of this series, although in all honesty, we could die right at the beginning of this episode and you would just never it, it happens it's a roguelike sometimes you walk into a room and you get sawed in half by a minigun wielded by a guy with horns and 14 arms that's just the way caves of cud goes it's a cruel mistress so it's time for a new game let's play i wanted to create a new character i do have a very very successful character no i don't never mind he died wow that's kind of a depressing feeling i had a character that was going really really well last night i played for a couple of hours and he lived he lived for a couple of hours and it went fantastically. I'm actually going to modify his build though. We're going to play him here today. Two options. So when you start the game out, you have two options. You can go with a mutated human, which means you get to play around with the mutations, which to me, I think is one of the major mechanics of the game that makes it interesting. Or you can go with true kin, which means that you're one of the last remaining humans whose genome has not changed. The cool thing about the last remaining humans is that they can rebuke robots. You know how in D&D, clerics get turn undead? Well, true humans can do that in this game. So if you come across robots or any type of weird automated facility, you have the ability to essentially turn robots. I assume that's because robots view anything with a mutated genome as maybe an enemy. The storyline is not super clear about it, but a true human would be free of those defects. And so I'm thinking that maybe... The true human has some mandate over the robots, some kind of Asimovian, I don't know, some kind of Asimovian command over the robots in one respect or another based on the way that they were programmed. They start with really, really high stats. So an unmutated human starts with amazing stats. They start with tons of skill points. They can rebuke robots, and then the Templars tend to like them a lot too, although I don't really, I don't think I've ever come across the Templars. Mutated humans, on the other hand, are a bit more interesting in that you can do all kinds of stuff. You can grow eyeballs, you can get eye lasers, you can get psychic powers. If you're mutated, you have more options to draw on, whereas if you just wanted to make like a gun monkey character who just goes in and beats everything to death and doesn't have a whole lot of triggerable abilities, you would want to go with the true human, the true kin. I'm going to go with the mutated human because I think it makes for more interesting gameplay in this playthrough. Now we've got a number of stats that were probably, oh, see, they should have, they could have had satire. It would have spelled satire right there, S-A-T-I-W-E. All they had to do is change whatever willpower is into something that starts with an R and your stats would be allocated by satire. The first thing we wanted to look at, so my character as we play through, I'm thinking about making a psychic character who brainwashes enemies and uses force walls to force the enemies to attack me from directions where I can manage them. I'm also thinking about making him a ranged character. He might do a little bit of melee, but not a lot. And so strength is easy. Strength determines how well you penetrate your opponent's armor with melee attacks, how much atta damage your attacks do, and your ability to mash your way through when something's trying to hold you in your carrying capacity. I would just take that one up to like there. You don't want to have too many minuses on strength, because if you do, you're not going to be able to carry enough loot to ever be efficient when you're coming back to town and buying and selling and stuff like that. However, 
If you take too much strength, it's actually going to hurt your other stats. Ego is going to be our first major stat. We're going to take that up and we're going to even it on out. Your ego score is basically how powerful your mental mutations are and how well you use psychic abilities. And I think it handles, it's kind of like charisma as well. It handles how well you buy stuff. It's written on the screen right now, so feel free to pause. Willpower determines the frequency with which you get your, mut your mental mutations and they come off cooldown. How fast you regenerate hit points, your ability to resist mental attacks. Intelligence is your ability to get skill points and identify artifacts. Toughness is your regeneration rate, how many hit points you have, your resistance to disease, and then agility is your to hit chance, more or less. I'll probably go with, so we've got ego all nice and evened out. Willpower, we're going to want decent willpower. Intelligence, I would take it up a little bit. Let's take these up just slightly. And now that we've got 16 points left over, if you wanted to get bonus points, so points that actually count towards getting plus ones and plus twos and stuff like that, it's going to start costing you more. The point cost goes up as you get higher and higher and higher in a score. That's to keep you from maxing out everything and just being a god of all stats related to killing, murder, being strong, and also shooting psychic bolts. I will probably dump a couple of points into ego, a couple of points into willpower so that our cooldowns come up a little bit quicker. With strength and agility, I think that looks pretty good right there. Intelligence is probably an okay call as well, considering everything we're going to be doing with this character. We will get stat bonuses from choosing our class in just a moment. I am going to, so the music in the background, I've actually added that in post. This game has no sound effects and it has no music as of yet. It's actually being made by the guys that did Sproggywood, if you ever played that game. Sproggywood was a game that they created solely so that they could raise money to keep working on this game. This game is basically their Dwarf Fortress. The developers, this is their passion project. They've been working on this for probably about a decade now. And they'll probably be working on it for another decade or two. I, I don't think this game will ever truly be finished, in all honesty, because it's one of those games that they just keep adding more stuff to. And when they need more money to keep working on this game, they develop another game, they put it up on Steam, and Sproggywood was really, really awesome. I liked Sproggywood a lot. And so they put the game up, they sell some copies of that game, and then they get back to working on this one. That's a workable business model. With Ego, we could tempt fate, and we could go up to plus two with Ego. And that would make us pretty damn good at the things that matter. From there, I would probably lower toughness by two. Yeah, let's lower toughness by two, because that's only going to give us minus one to our HP. And I would say... Willpower's not a horrible thing to put stats into. Oh, it's going to cost us two. Okay. Well... Let's take this and we'll put it into... You know what? We'll be a little bit of a fighter. We'll put in a couple of points right there because we're going to even out our agility anyways, I think, when we pick our class. And that's going to be good enough for right now. You press spacebar so that you can finalize all this. Our stats have been allocated. I'm not playing the most efficient way I could be playing. Honestly, I haven't played this game in about a year. I've done like three or four playthroughs the last couple days just to reacclimate myself to the title. But... Haven't really played a shit ton lately. So, the first thing we can do here, this is the mutations menu, and this is where we get 12 points to get our beginning mutations. We can go with Chimera, which means that when we take a random mutation later on in the game, you can only take random mutations after this point. You don't get to pick them anymore once your character is in the world. You just hit a button, and you exchange your skill points from leveling up in exchange for a random mutation. Chimera and Esper, they both give you... A relative level of control over that. This will make it so that you can only get physical mutations. This will make it so you can only get mental mutations. Unstable Genome makes it so that you get a bonus mutation. And whenever you get a level, there's a 33% chance that you get to pick between three mutations. Now, that can work out really, really well, or it can work out really, really terribly. I've had it swing both directions. Some games, Unstable Genome has made me ridiculously overpowered. And some games, Unstable Genome just doesn't seem to do much. You just get, like, crappy mutations. Or you just don't mutate at all, and those points are just wasted. In physical mutations, there is all kinds of stuff here. Legitimately too many things for me to cover. There are so many mutations that we don't have time to talk about them all. They do all kinds of random stuff. All I can say is that if you wanted to check them all out, I highly recommend that you get the game for yourself. Have a good time with it. It is a fantastic title. The one that I'm leaning towards is I almost always take night vision. So there it is right there. That just means that I don't have to carry a torch around in my hand with me. when I'm Actually, but we're going to have a free hand because we don't have shield proficiency. 
So maybe I won't take night vision this time around. Maybe I'll keep a torch on me and then we'll try to get a glow globe early on. We can also take defects if you really, really want to. They will give you bonus points so that you can evolve even better. I would say to wait on those for right now. I'm going to take Beguiling. This gives me the ability to convince enemies that I'm a friend and it makes them fight for me permanently. It basically gives you a bodyguard pet that you can use whenever you want. Force Bubble I'm also a big fan of. It's a little bit expensive, but if you're using ranged weapons it can be pretty good. Confusion is pretty solid as well. Cryokinesis and Domination aren't... I mean, it's not that bad. But I would just take Beguiling because with Domination it puts you, I think it knocks you out and then you control a monster, which on a busy battlefield is not going to work out great. Whereas Beguiling makes it so that you stay awake and then you just have a pet that follows you around and kicks the crap out of everything. There's Masked Mind. Oh, that allows me to refresh all of my mental mutations. That's not bad. Kindle allows me to set a fire. Ego Projection allows me to, I think... Yeah, augments a attribute to allow you. That's not. I'm gonna take that. I'm not gonna take that right there. Pyrokinesis is interesting. I'm gonna do Siphon Vim. I've never taken that one before, and so I think it might be interesting. That allows me to siphon someone's life force over 20 rounds, and so it lets you regenerate 20 HP, one HP per turn, off of an enemy that has come inside your area. Mental Mirror, Psychometry, Teleportation, Time Dilation is pretty good. I would say that it, it works out alright. We've got Amnesia. We've got Blinking Tick. Makes you teleport uncontrollably. Evil Twin. Narcolepsy. Randomly fall asleep. Socially repugnant. Five times the usual prices for wares. Ooh, that's brutal for that cost. Although the physical mutations, we might be able to get something in here. So we've got Amphibious. You require submersion in fresh water. You have a lack of developed pain. You can only determine your general state of health and not your number of hit points. Yeah, I'll take that one. Well, maybe I won't. The Beak. Your face has an unsightly beak. You can't wear a face mask and you lose ego. You occasionally peck your opponents though and then birds like you a little bit better. Brittle Bones. 150% damage from falling. Attack made from cudgels and other sources. Eh, it's a little rough chance to set or knock out all of the artifacts that I'm carrying. Your blood does not clot easily. That one's a rough risk to take. Hooks for feet. Myopia. You can only see four around you. Ravenous. Uh, these are all a little rough. They're all a little rough. Although I think analgesia, oh, that would give me two. What could I spend the two on though? So let's say that I take Force Bubble. That gives me one left over. I can sense Psychic. I can take Telepathy. With physical mutations, what could I take in here? I could get Night Vision, Slime Glands, or Thick Fur. Thick Fur isn't a horrible one to take. It gives you a little bit of resistance to the things that are going to hurt you quite a bit later on. We can also spit Viscous Slime at things, or we can take Night Vision. I'm going to take Thick Fur. We're going to be a monkey man. Let's be a monkey man, and I think that'll just about do it for the things that we've selected in our mutations menu. Alright, so we get to pick our class now. We can be an apostle, which is kind of a charisma class. Gives you abilities and skills having to do with convincing other people to do stuff. We can go with Arcanaut. An Arcanaut is kind of a general purpose character. Jack of all trades, basically a bard type character. We've got a Greybeard. The Greybeard, I think, is pretty good at hitting stuff. And as far as I know, is a willpower focus build. But aside from that, don't know what else he does. Gunslinger, pretty self-explanatory. Marauder, a berserker, or a barbarian, basically. A pilgrim, kind of like the Arcanaut, but more willpower-based. Has abilities that have to do with getting your abilities to cool down faster and making yourself not eat food, stuff like that. Nomad, weird all-arounder character that's really, really good with outside stuff. So good at, like, survivalism. There's the Scholar. Really, really good with technology and intelligence. The Tinker, pretty much the same thing, except instead of being good with wilderness lore, they trade that out with the Tinker and give you the ability to disassemble and build objects, which is actually pretty good. The Warden, good at fighting, uses swords, basically like Aragorn. Pretty good with like ranged weapons and physical weapons. Water Merchant, another charisma-based class, allows you to sell stuff. Allows you entrance to places you might not be able to get into otherwise because you're a trader. Water Vine Farmer allows you to be a bit of a survivalist. You can also get access to farmer's markets. 
for the case of this playthrough, I would probably lead towards something. An Ego class would be a good call, so something like an Apostle would be a good idea. The Arcanaut is an ever-present decent choice. It's never a bad idea to go with the Arcanaut. If you don't know what to pick, the Arcanaut tends to be what I go with. Gunslinger is okay, and that would fit into our build really, really well too, because we do have Force Wall. So I would consider going into Gunslinger, but that would leave considerable holes in our build that would require a little bit more effort. I... The Warden would give us a decent selection of random abilities that would be good, and then we'd have to fill everything out later. Staunch Wounds, Heal... Well... Let's go with something that I think is going to flesh out our build. Now, we don't have access to any sort of ranged weaponry. We don't have access to any sort of weapons proficiency, so that would narrow us down to probably Arcanaut, or that would put us down to Warden. I'm going to go with Arcanaut, because it's just... Uh, everybody plays the Arcanaut when they play on, on YouTube, but I'll be honest, it's a really, really good selection. Like, it's just a really good all-arounder class that is not going to cost you anything. Warden's not a bad call either, although Tinker would put us in a really, really good spot because then I could build stuff and fix things. Fixing things is kind of... Everything ends up broken in this game. Yeah, let's be a Tinker. It's weird how that took a turn, although that leaves us with no weapons proficiencies. So we won't have any weapons. Luckily, we can brainwash something else to fight for us, so it shouldn't be too bad. There's our final build. Let's go ahead and start the game off. What was our name? We'll call him Albrecht. Always liked that name. On the 4th of Schwut Ux, you arrive at the oasis hamlet of Joppa, along the far rim of Mograyi, the Great Salt Desert. All around you, moisture farmers tend to groves of Viridian water vine. There are huts wrought from rock salt and brine stock. On the horizon, cuds jungle strangle chrome steeples and rusted archways to the earth. Further and beyond, the fabled spindle rises above the fray and pierces the cloud-ribbon sky. So there's our little character right there. We're the white guy at the bottom of the screen. I have been known to be the white guy over the course of my life. There's a bunch of stuff that you could do in this first little town of Joppa, but I wanted to point out they added little torches and stuff. The developers, every time I play this game, I usually take, it's kind of like Mountain Blade Warband for me. Every six months I play this game. And when I come back, every single time, there's a bunch of new stuff in the game. Look to the north, the zealot yells. Journey to the six-day stilt and pay homage to your saviors. Well, the first thing we want to do is talk to this guy. The nice thing about this title is all contextual actions are controlled with the space bar. So we just press space. And if there's an action that can be taken adjacent to your character, it will automatically take that action or ask you what action you want to take. Live and drink, my friend. May you find shade in Joppa. What can you tell me about Joppa? Well, you would be wise to speak with Elder Iridad. Look for his hut to the north. I'm in search of work. Some critters are eating our water vine. Farouk claims he saw one slicking around a vine patch. Ugly little thing, he says. Pale, white, eight legs, and an ear-splitting wine. Noticed a bit of red dirt in the water vine pool, the same that we find in the soil at a nearby cave to the north that we call Red Rock. Travel there. Kill as many of these critters as you can, and bring back the corpse of one, too. Elder Iridad will reward your efforts then I will do as you ask. You can also press the L key to look at stuff if you just wanted to look around town. It's a torch sconce right there. This guy over here is Mamet. Years of the desert have taken their toll on his body, but he commands your ear with his voice like few other men, and you wonder what sovereignty he might have come to were he not born a moisture farmer. He is loved by villagers of Joppa. He is admired by oozes for penning a moving poem. He has no enemies, though. Every ally and every, like, character in this game has a random backstory and history. And what you'll find is that, like, sometimes Mamet is hated by monkey men. It's just hated by monkey men because he spit in the eye of one of their leaders or something like that. Every character has their own little backstory. And so if you're into stuff like that, this game could be tremendously interesting. This guy over here, what is he? The Zealot of the Six Day Stilt. He preaches the Chromaic Gospel of the Mechanimists. Precious saliva flies from his cracked lips, but he's too wrapped in the music of his words to notice. He has the Canticles Chromatic, verses 17 through 24. Okay. Let's go back inside over here. We want to close this door using the space bar and the directions key. Because we want to rob all these houses of their treasure. Sometimes you can get some very, very nice stuff to start out with just by going through these chests. And so it honestly tends to be the first thing you do. There's a cape right there. There's an artifact, a violet tube. There's a vine wafer, there's two copper nuggets, which are a trade item. 
There's a plastic tree, which is a trinket or a curiosity. No, don't disassemble it. Oh, no, I disassembled it into scrap crystal. I could have used that as a throwaway for a quest that's coming up. Damn. All right, well, that's disappointing. I wish that that had not happened, but we are good at disassembling things, so maybe it'll help. Ooh, kitty. Hey, what's going on, kitty? What are you doing? Kitty, no. What are you doing, kitty? You pet Cephas, or Sisyphus, for good luck. Sisyphus says meow, and you start to glow. I'm glowing. One star ribbon night, a ray cat crossed the marshy loam and wandered into Joppa. The water vine farmers, wakened by the joyful cries of a small girl, gathered around to revel at the favorable omen and extol the generosity of the beetle moon. Since then, Sisyphus has spent his days curled under the shade of brinestock huts and sauntering over dirt paths. So long as he's approached with care, he welcomes the hands of friends and strangers alike. He's a phosphorescent, docile cat. He has bite and claw claw as his abilities. Hooray! You gotta watch out for that mystical art of claw claw. Somebody starts throwing around claw claw. It's terrifying. It's a copper nugget and a water skin inside of here. So inside the confines of Cud, water is the currency. If you don't have water, you can't buy anything. You also, if you look in the menu over here to the left, you've got quenched and sated. You've got to feed yourself as you play the game. So be forewarned. You need water to keep yourself alive, but it's also your currency. I would assume that as far as inflation goes, that would do pretty well with regard... Oh yeah, close the doors behind you when you're robbing the chests. If anybody sees you stealing out of the chest, you're definitely going to get into trouble. So we've got a leather apron, we've got weird artifacts, and we've got some torches. I'm going to press the I key to go into my inventory, and because I took the class that I took, we should be able to examine and identify what these are. So this is a skulk injector. I believe a skulk injector... Makes it so you get really, really good at sneaking around. Yeah, your movement speed is increased by 25% at night and underground, but reduced by 20% in the daylight. If you're at night or underground, you get plus 3 to your agility score. You also grow burrowing claws. You get double damage from light-based attacks. So that might be useful later on. I'm going to look at this as well. A puzzling artifact. Let's examine it. It is a poison gas grenade. Okay. On this side, we've got another weird artifact. That is a stun gas grenade. Both of those might be useful later on. We've also got a data disc, which gives us the terrifying visage. I will learn that, although I don't know what it does. You can pan in between these menus by pressing the 7 or the 9 key. You can see that at the bottom right-hand corner of the menu. Let's go see what this does. Oh, there it is, the terrifying visage. This item reduces the cooldowns of berate, intimidate, and menacing stare by 10 rounds. Oh, okay. So it's like one, it's just like an artifact that I can carry with me. Cool. We've also got a bunch of gear right here that I would take a look at just to see what we've got. I would take off my cloth robe so that I'm standing in the middle of town uber naked. I'm going to put on that leather apron. If you're looking at the stats of the item right there, if it's got a little diamond right there, that's its armor value. So it reduces damage by that amount. This little black circle right here is its dodge value. As for my head, I don't think I have anything I can wear there. Nothing on the face. I can get a burnoose for my back, though, that'll give me a little bit more dodge. We've got slugs in our left hand. Those gooey little critters that everybody loves to hate. I will put a bronze dagger. Well, no, we'll keep the hand axe, I guess. If you're looking at the stats of the weapons, this is the penetration value of the weapon. It cancels out that much armor when it hits the enemy. And then once it gets through the armor, it does one dice roll of three damage. If you've never played D&D before... That means you've got a three-sided dice, you roll it, it will do between one and three damage. That's all. Don't think we have anything for our hands right now as far as our feet go. We don't have anything there. With the held throwing weapon, I'll probably get a stun gas grenade just in case I end up needing it. For my left hand, I would put a torch in there because we're not going to be able to see without it. So I would recommend having some torches around. There's not going to be anything else inside this area. Instead, what I would recommend we do is there's a second quest in town over here with this guy. So we're going to come talk to him. Tensile Strength of Reblon, but it's lacking in Dino Elasticity. Retro-threading the M-Band might probably... Uh... Oh, I didn't notice you there. It's because I was ignoring you. Nothing a trace yield of synthetic linseed solvent... Uh... Unexpected deviation from the clank constant. I am. Uh, do you really need to disturb me right now? What are you, some sort of treasure hunter? At the very least, make yourself useful and bring me a knickknack from one of the caves. I might just reward you. Where can I find the cave? There are caves everywhere, you dolt. It's cud. Try the rust wells. They're to the east of here. 
All right, I'll get you a knickknack then. We already have knickknacks. We have a skulk injector and we have a poison gas grenade. I'm going to give him the poison gas grenade. So we've completed the quest. That'll give us 75 XP. Oh, it appears you may be useful after all. Now uh, go get me another one. If I have to. And I'll actually give him the skulk injector because it's valuable, but... Well, actually, no. I may use the Skulk Ejector to trade. We're going to find plenty of artifacts and whatnot as we go into the caves in the next episode. My name is Splattercat. This game is called Caves of Cud. It's a roguelike game that is near and dear to my heart. It's probably one of my favorite games. It's very much a passion project for me here today. I always wanted to play this on the channel, and so now I have the opportunity to invite all of you to play it with me. I will see you all when next we meet, which will probably be tomorrow. Caves of Cud, get it down below if you like what I do here on the channel. Check out the Patreon that I have. It funds a Discord channel. It, for, it funds giveaways and all kinds of fun stuff like that. Uh, I would check it out. You also get bonus VODs like a week earlier. You get like the unedited version so you can see what I'm working towards right now. Text reviews, stuff like that. Just little bonus things to say thank you for supporting me and making sure I don't starve. I will see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody. It's been fun.